everyone, let me briefly introduce myself. My name is Sinis KP Pareja and I am delighted to be here to talk to you about these two theories. Socialist Organization Theory and Concentrism Theory. My objective today is to understand the main idea of these theories and to know how it helped the law enforcers to lessen or eliminate the crime way back then. Before I start, does any one of you know the word disorganization? When we say disorganization, it is the lack of proper planning and control. Meaning to say, social disorganization theory talks about a disorganized community. This theory seeks to explain community differences in crime rates based on structural and cultural factors shaping the nature of social order across the community. Social disorganization theory was first developed to investigate why certain neighborhoods have more social problems, especially delinquency, than others. At the core of the social disorganization theory, location matters when it comes to predicting illegal activity. In sociology, Social disorganization theory is one of the most important theory that is developed by the Chicago School. According to the social disorganization theory, there are ecological factors that lead to the high rates of crime in these communities. And these factors are constantly linked in elevated levels of high school dropouts, unemployment, deteriorating infrastructure, and single parent homes. So why did these people end up on being high school dropout, unemployed, and a single parent? This is because they all are experiencing poverty. Poverty is the mother of crime. Poverty may increase social disorganization, which in turn may lead to youth violence. Poverty may moderate or condition the relationship between the social disorganization and youth violence. These high school dropouts may lead to different kind of citizens. Some of them may be the one who can help their community to become better. But as to reality, most of them become the one who will make their community more disorganized. In addition, community that doesn't have their own leader tends to become a chaotic community filled with turbulent citizens that may commit crime. For me, the best example for this theory is the life of the squatter in Manila. Squatter is the one you call to the people who does squatting. Squatting is when someone occupies an empty or abandoned property which they don't own or rent without the permission of its owner. Specifically, the influence of social disorganization on crime may be pronounced in poor areas and attenuated in affluent areas. As you can see at my side, these were the proponents of the social disorganized theory. Sean McKay claimed that delinquency is caused at the individual level, but it's a normal response by normal individual to abnormal conditions. Socialist organization theory is widely used as an important prediction to youth violence and crime. Therefore, location matters when it comes to criminality. 
This theory can help government and law enforcement policymakers make informed decisions from evidence to form strategies that help prevent the criminal activity in disadvantaged communities to make it safer for all. So much for the social disorganization theory. So now I'd like to move on to the next part. So today, I want to talk to you about the urban development, particularly to the urban models. But today, our focus is the concentric zone model, also known as the Burgess model or the CCD model. One such human ecology theory was developed by Ernest Burgess in 1923. Burgess was the first sociologist to pose a theory why certain social groups are located in specific urban areas. His model is based on the city of Chicago and used concentric rings to show how urban land was used. This model explains how the cities expand from the center and the rings have different land uses. This is how concentric zone model looks like. The first zone is considered as the downtown area and contains businesses and shops. The CBD is also known as the financial district, which it is a place to find services that doesn't exist elsewhere. The second zone was termed as the zone of transition and included a mix of residential and commercial dwellings. This zone of transition is considered to decay because of the large numbers of old structures as the buildings were abandoned. Those residing in this zone were of the poorest segment and had the lowest housing condition. People living in the third zone are considered as the second generation immigrants, as many moves out of the transition zone were never affordable. This zone is the nearest to the working areas with modest living conditions, and it includes the large rental housing occupied by the single workers. In the fourth zone of concentric zone, it has a large area of residential land. People live in the outer ring look for a better quality of life. People living in the fifth zone are high income groups, which could afford large houses, could pay commuting charges, had access to different transportation, and enjoy mode facilities like shopping malls. Concentric zone theory influenced the Homer Hoyt section in 1939 and Harrison Almond's multiple nuclear model in 1945. Their study proved that concentric zone model cannot be applied in every city because as the people learn to be successful and have their own businesses, the CBD has gone on its center. I think concentric zone theory ties in with social disorganization theory. These two theories has a big part on supporting the modern concept of police service in which the yardstick of police efficiency is the absence of crime. Because of concentric zone theory, law enforcers were able to identify in which part of the city have the highest possibility of people that may commit illegal activities. Time pertaining to the second zone, the zone of transition, which has the highest crime rate and in this zone, you can find those disorganized community that I've mentioned in social disorganization theory. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention.